Feeling pain, something everyone has experienced. Have you ever wondered how your body responds to and deals with pain? Well, it all started in 1975. Researchers led by Ann Endocrinol thought, if exogenous opiates like morphine bind to cell surface receptors already in the body, then the body itself must have some endogenous opiate-like substance for these receptors to bind. That endogenous opiate was me. I am Inca Felon, and this is my story. But how does it even work? How do we feel pain to begin with? If you're wondering just how it is that I do what I do, the first thing you have to understand is the pain transduction pathway. First, the sensory neuron passes the signal through waves of depolarization and repolarization and transmits that signal to the spinal cord. This causes the release of a certain receptor specialized for pain signaling, substance P. Substance P normally sends the pain signal to the second order neuron. Later, if I'm not around, the signal will reach the thalamus through the spinothalamic tract and pass the signal to the third order neuron. Sensory fibers will receive the signal, go through the dorsal horn, and then to the motor fibers involved with the response. The pain signal will continue to follow the spinothalamic tract until it reaches the somatosensory cortex. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where I join the party. I'm born in the VTA area of the somatosensory cortex, which is perfect for me because the somatosensory cortex just happens to be where it all goes down. Sensory information taken from all over the body is processed right here. All right, sidebar. Once I'm activated, you may find me anywhere from the central nervous system to the periphery and spinal cord. Here's why I can induce pain signals at any of these steps. To summarize, pain travels up the spinal cord and then to the dorsal horn via the sensory fibers. The signal goes from the periphery to the spinal cord to the central nervous system. My receptors are located throughout this pathway. Let's talk a little more about me. I am a pentapeptide molecule, and my kind comes in different forms. I happen to be an encephalon of the MET variety, but there are Lou encephalons as well. Everybody says we look the same, but differ only one amino acid. I have methionine, where some of my peers have leucine, but overall we're functionally quite alike. Now a bit about my ancestry. My grandmother's name is chromosome 8. I know, flashy. And she encodes for my mom, Proencephalon. Without them, there would be no me. See, when my mom was young, she didn't like dates. In my world, dating is called the proteolytical process. That's when my mom, Proencephalon, ran away from potential boyfriends enzymes 1 and 2 pro-hormone convertes. Eventually one of them won her heart, and quadruplets were born. That includes me. My siblings and I started out in the synaptic vesicle and the neurons axon terminal. A little more depth on my rise to fame. Pro-hormone convertase 1 and pro-hormone convertase 2 reduce PENC in two intermediates, which get further reduced by carboxypeptase. This is how myself and my three siblings are born. My team and I are eventually provoked to come into action and get released into the synaptic cleft by the calcium influx into the cell, or in other words, depolarization.
I clock out of work when calcium ions leave the cell. It's not in my best interest to be around for repolarization of the cell, so five different enzymes called enkephalinases come along and give me a ride out of the postsynaptic cleft. Repolarization occurs and the enzyme cleanses the postsynaptic cleft of enkephalin. Now this is when I bind to opioid receptors on the neuron, either mu or delta. We all have to change our conformation in order to attach to opioid receptors. Some humans did an experiment with x-ray crystallography that showed I can stretch to achieve anti-parallel form or beta-bend monomeric structure. These are both special conformations that allow me to attach to the opioid receptor. The location of these events may include the periphery, the central nervous system, the ventral tegmental area, the spinal cord, and the dorsal horn. Let's imagine for a second you've got too much of me. Overproduction of enkephalin can cause intestinal distress because they have captor receptors that bind with me as well. Now let's say there wasn't enough of me to go around. Enkephalin deficiency may result in decreased stress reactivity. Based on the knowledge that the opioid peptide is a modulator in the stress response, researchers hypothesized that mice with dysfunctional proenkephalin allele, pank knockout mice, which would not be able to produce enkephalin, would show increased responsiveness to stressful stimuli. Mice without damaged proenkephalin genes were the control. These individuals were able to increase expression of the enkephalin when exposed to the stressful conditions, but showed it enhanced levels of anxiety as well as symptoms of depression. The Penk knockout group, when tested under the same conditions, were not symptomatic of anxiety and depression. This opposed the hypothesis. The results of the study on Penk knockout mice suggest that enkephalin enhances the stress response rather than numbing it. While there are no known demographics that seem to be predisposed to enkephalin deficiency, biologists' understanding of the genetics tell us that deleterious mutations to the Penk gene will result in offspring without enkephalin. Therefore, any individual can be predisposed to the condition if the parent has that particular mutation. A solution to the lack of me, may it be genetic predisposition or just a simple injury, could be any of the synthetic knockoffs of me. Synthetic versions of enkephalin include the entirety of drug class opioids. Examples include morphine, oxycotton, Vicodin, methadone, hydrocodone, Demerol, as well as many others. The prevalence of prescription painkillers in the pharmaceutical industry means that there are plenty of exogenous alternatives to the body's natural painkillers. That Symptoms of using too many synthetic alternatives to me include addiction, constipation, hallucinations, and dry mouth. Like I said, there's plenty of access to the knockoffs. Some are derived from plants, and some are completely synthetic. And now a note on my modulation. Although the mechanism is not explicitly known, there is research that suggests that endogenous opioids such as me are regulated by negative feedback. Now everyone knows that I bind to mu and delta opioid receptors. A study involved the addition of agonists to mu and delta receptors to the spinal canals of rats. These inhibit the spinal outflow, or loss, of enkephalin. Antagonists, naloxone and naltrindol, were also injected. The result? of the study was partially unexpected. The naltrindol actually increased the overflow of enkephalin. As expected, naloxone did not. Thus, the receptors that naltrindol correspond to, the delta receptors, 
don't seem to be under negative feedback control. However, the data of the rat spinal column experiment suggests that the binding of met encephalin to mu receptors may be modulated by negative feedback mechanism. It's a cruel world. Painful stimuli are all around us, and I'm here to help you along the way. I am Encephalon, a humble servant and a silent protector always by your side.